Welcome to Soul Food, a ministry of Calvary Chapel, Princeton, West Virginia. Bob Russell shared an interesting illustration about darkness several years back with the Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. He said, every once in a while a bird gets inside the sanctuary. He doesn't really want to be there, but he's trapped. We also don't want him to be in there because he can be messy and disruptive. Do you know how the facilities department gets a bird out of such a huge room? They don't put out poison bird seed or take a shotgun to him. The goal is not to destroy, but to release. The solution is simple. They turn out all the lights until it's pitch black, and then they turn on a bright exit light in the hallway, and the bird will instinctively then fly to that light. This morning, Jesus is going to say in verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And that is stupendously good news for all of mankind. Why? Because we were all trapped in the darkness of sin. But Jesus came as the mighty God to illuminate the way to salvation. But if you don't come to him... God loves you so much that he may allow the darkness around you to increase. Now why would he do that? He would do that so that the light looks brighter only in the hopes of saving you. Now, one would think that sinners hopelessly lost in the darkness would automatically just run to the light. Yet in a strange paradox... People love the very darkness that ensnares them. Like a dying man who cherishes the disease that is killing him, they cherish the sin that produces spiritual and ultimately eternal death. In John 3.19, Jesus explained, This is the judgment. The light is coming to the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. So when Jesus claims to be the light of the world, contained in that statement is the idea that the world that we live in is a very dark place. In fact, it is so utterly dark that I don't have to provide you any illustrations to back up that claim. We now live in Babylon. This is why we are warned in Ephesians 6.12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Make no mistake about it. We live in a dark age. So what, if anything, can remedy that? That's what we'll be looking at this morning. Look at verse 12 with me. And Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. Who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus' claim to be the world's light is the second of the seven great I am statements that are a unique feature that we find in the Gospel of John. We've already covered the first one back in John 6, 25, when Jesus proclaimed, I am the bread of life. The next is today's, I am the light of the world. The last five will be, I am the gate, John 10, 7. I am the good shepherd, John 10, 11. I am the resurrection and the life, John 11, 25. I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. And finally, I am the good shepherd, John 15, 1. Now, throughout history, people have always sought to know the truth about reality, about what is right and wrong, and about what is meaningful and purposeful in life. And as a result, 
Endless philosophies, worldviews, and religious systems has arisen over the centuries, each purporting to teach absolute truth and each in turn canceling out the supposed absolute truths of those that came before it. The belief that mankind, on his own, could formulate the perfect philosophical system, one that would fully explain all of reality, reached its peak during what has been termed the Enlightenment Age. Human reason, it was thought, would eventually discover the answers to all of life's questions and thereby solve all of society's problems. The assumption was that through intellectual achievements and the growing body of scientific knowledge, humanity would eventually bring about a utopia. Hence, there was no need for religion, which the Enlightenment insisted had kept people in stifling darkness for centuries. There was no interest in divine revelation or salvation, since man believed that he himself could save himself from all of his problems. But the optimism of the Enlightenment has faded to black in recent times. The unimaginable slaughter of two world wars, the unfathomable evil of the Holocaust, and the terrifying reality of nuclear war quickly shattered the unrealistic idolism of the 18th and 19th centuries. In its place, pessimism and skepticism began to take hold as feelings of uncertainty about life and even about reality became more and more widespread. As feelings of uncertainty about life and even reality became widespread. Increasingly, the very concept of truth itself came under fire, especially the possibility of knowing absolute truth. And for many people, that is exactly what they want. Now, why would I say that? Sinners want to do evil and feel no guilt. So the lack of absolutes accommodates the desperately wicked human heart. As Francis Schaeffer once put it, all of Western culture, including philosophy, art, music, literature, education, and modern theology, in rejecting scripture, plunged beneath the line of despair. The irony of all that is that people imagine that by denying the existence of absolute truth and throwing off the shackles of biblical morality, they would finally be set free. Instead, they found themselves only empty and enslaved to destructive and debilitating passions. The culture we live in this morning is quickly descending into total and pitch black darkness to the degree that people can no longer even determine what sex they are. Why? Because God is and has been judging the ascending wickedness of this world. When I think of sin's darkness, my mind goes back to God's judgment in Exodus 10.21, where we read this. And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness that may be felt. I hope that none of us have become so conditioned to this culture that we can no longer feel the darkness. Simply put, anytime you put out the light, darkness is going to take over. All you school teachers will appreciate this next example. It's been noted that back in the 1950s, the biggest disciplinary problems teachers had to deal with were things like talking in class, tardiness, running in the halls, and chewing gum. I've talked to some of you guys. You would give your right arm to teach in a school where those were the problems. Today, instead, you have a complete disregard for any kind of authority, rampant use of alcohol and drugs, fifth graders having sex, and mass school shootings. 
Yeah, that sounds like utopia to me. We live in a dark world, a world eclipsed by the long shadow of sin. In desperation, the lost people around us frantically search for the truth without the facility to find it. I love how the prophet Isaiah describes the futility of sin and walking in the darkness. This is Isaiah 59.9. Therefore justice is far from us and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, but behold darkness. For brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope along the wall like blind men. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at midday as in the twilight. Among those who are vigorous, we are like dead men. That is the plight of all mankind without the light of Christ. The best we can do is to stumble around pitifully in the dark. And because of their spiritual blindness, they only stumble deeper into sin's hopeless gloom. Then they find themselves utterly trapped in the snares of immorality, idolatry, and all the unfruitful deeds of darkness, as Ephesians 5.11 puts it. The Bible describes those as those who leave the path of unrighteousness to walk in the way of darkness. So is there any hope at all? Thank God there is, and I mean that literally. Jesus Christ alone brings the light of salvation to a sin-cursed world. To the darkness of falsehood, he is a light of truth. To the darkness of ignorance, he is a light of wisdom. To the darkness of sin, he is the light of holiness. To the darkness of sorrow, he is the light of joy. And to the darkness of death, he is the light of life. No other religion or philosophy can even come close to offering that. C.S. Lewis is widely and justly quoted for this remark. He said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. But that idea goes back far more to the Bible itself. The psalmist, for example, says in Psalm 36, 7, How precious is your loving kindness, O God! And the children of man take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They drink their fill of the abundance of your house, and you give them your river to drink of the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. Or as the King James puts it in Psalm 119, the entrance of thy word giveth light. That tells me it is only by the light of the scripture eliminated by the Holy Spirit that we are able to navigate this dark world. And so Jesus says, I am that living light. I am the embodiment of all of the scripture. If we are to understand the full import of what Jesus was claiming when he claimed to be the light of the world, we must understand this verse in terms of that to which Jesus was, not, was undoubtedly referring. This is particularly important because it's not what we would most naturally think. We read the verse, I am the light of the world, and we think of the sun that shines up in the sky. But we have to remember the time in which he uttered these words. The Lord's I Am statement was related to the Feast of Tabernacles, during which a huge candelabra was lit in the temple at night to remind the people of the pillar of fire that had guided Israel through their wilderness journey. You see, every night they would light this enormous candelabra at one place in the temple, and it had a number of huge lamps inside of it. Those lamps were so huge that they, that they were lit, the light just flooded into the rest of the city. And then the orchestras of the temple would strike out and cut loose and the people would dance. It was remarkable. Why? Because it was remembering. It was commemorating. Not just how God gave them shelter. Not just how God gave them water. But how God also gave them light in the wilderness. Do you remember how? 
As they were leaving Egypt, suddenly something appeared before them. In the daytime, it looked like a cloud and it sheltered them from the sun. When the sun began going down, instead of what usually happens to clouds, and that is that they get invisible, this cloud instead began to radiate. The cloud began to glow. And when the sun went all the way down, it was the darkest of dark and the pitches of black. The cloud was then a pillar of fire. This conclusion is supported by the fact that if that is so, then we have a striking succession of three great wilderness images in John 6, 7, and 8. Think about it. In chapter 6, Jesus is the new manna sent down from heaven. In chapter 7, he is the water provided miraculously from the rock. And now here in chapter 8, he is the cloud that provided the light. We therefore turn to the cloud itself and to its functions in order to determine the full meaning of the second of the I am sayings of John's gospel. The analogy of light, as when Jesus earlier used that metaphor of living water, was practically relevant to the Feast of Tabernacles. The daily water pouring ceremony had its nightly counterpart in a lamp lighting ceremony. It was the very court where Jesus was presently speaking. And huge candelabras were lit, pushing light up into the sky like a searchlight. So brilliant was their light that one ancient Jewish source declared there was not a courtyard in Jerusalem that did not reflect their light. And so to understand what Jesus had in mind when, as he spoke to the people, we must remember that these words were spoken shortly after the Feast of Tabernacles in the courtyard of the temple area. This is where the ceremonies that were part of the feast were conducted. We've already noted one of these ceremonies. On each morning of the eight-day feast, the priests of Israel joined in a procession to the Pool of Siloam, from which they drew water in golden pitchers. Then returning to the temple area, they poured the water out on the altar of sacrifice. As they did this, people, many of whom had accompanied the priest, sang and chanted. One verse they used was Isaiah 12, 3. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. The second ceremony was similar. On the first night of the feast and on all the succeeding nights also, after the sun had set, great lamps were lit in the courts of the temple. The lamps were meant to recall the pillar of cloud and the fire that had accompanied the people during their wilderness wanderings. This was the cloud that had appeared to them on the day that they left Egypt. And it stood between the Israelites and the pursuing army of the Egyptians as they crossed the Red Sea. It kept the Jewish people from being attacked. And later it would guide the people through the wilderness. It also spread out to give them shade by day and warmth by night. I believe that this is a clear reference to the ceremony of lighting the lamps. And therefore also the miraculous cloud itself that Jesus referred to when he claimed to be the light of the world. This was no small task what had happened, by the way. We must remember that at the point when they left Egypt, there were probably about 2 million of them. The Bible says that there were 600,000 men, but of course wives and children need to be added to that number. This vast company of people was being led out to a desert region that, as anyone who has ever been there can tell you, is one of the most inhospitable places in all the earth. I've been to a place like that when I went to Turkey. It's like living on the surface of the sun. It's so hot that when a dog chases a cat, they both just walk. <laughs> In the daytime, temperature can easily reach 120 to 130 degrees. And at night, it'll fall below freezing often. To survive in such a region, the vast, hope of, the vast host of Israel needed water and shelter from the sun. The rock, which Moses was instructed to smite with his rod, provided the water. And now shelter would be provided by the cloud. Without this special and miraculous provision, the people would have died. God's protection of the people is in one of our hymns where it says, 
Round each habitation hovering, see the cloud and fire appear. For a glory and a covering, showing that the Lord is near. Thus deriving from their banner, light by night and shade by day, safe they feed upon the manna which God gives them when they pray. And so we see the cloud was important because it was the primary means by which God guided the people while they were in the desert. I don't know if we can fully appreciate the importance of this. There were few, if any, landmarks in the desert. And the people would not have recognized landmarks even if they would have seen them. Besides, the heat of the desert produces mirages, distorts distances, and makes most terrains indistinguishable. So how were the people to find their way? How were they to avoid wandering into hostile territory or just going around in circles? The answer was, God gave them a cloud. When the cloud moved, they were to move. Indeed, they had to move. For if they would have remained where they were, they would soon have, would have died from the heat of the day or the cold at night. When the cloud remained in one place, they remained. One long passage in the book in Numbers makes this particularly clear. This is Numbers 9.17. Whenever the cloud was lifted from over the tent, afterward the sons of Israel would then set out. And in the place where the cloud settled down, there the sons of Israel would camp. At the command of the Lord, the sons of Israel would set out, and at the command of the Lord, they would camp. As long as the cloud settled over the tabernacle, they remained camped. Even when the cloud lingered over the tabernacle for many days, the sons of Israel would keep the Lord's charge and not set out. If sometimes the cloud remained for a few days over the tabernacle, according to the command of the Lord, they remained camped. Then according to the command of the Lord, they set out. If sometimes the cloud remained from evening until morning, when the cloud was lifted in the morning, they would move out. Or if it remained in the daytime and at night, whenever the cloud lifted, they would set out. Whether it was two days, a month, or a year that the cloud lingered over the tabernacle, staying above it, the sons of Israel camped and did not set out. But when it was lifted, they did set out. At the command of the Lord they camped, and at the command of the Lord they set out. They kept the Lord's charge according to the command of the Lord through Moses. I hope we can see how this applies to Christ's statement this morning. For when he claimed to be the light of the world, it is in clear reference to the cloud of Israel's wanderings. He was claiming not only that he was God with his people, or that he was the one who would protect them, but also that he is the one who will give us guidance. Thus, when Jesus moves before us, we are to move. And when he abides for a long time in one place, we too are to remain there. Now back to our New Testament passage. Apply this now to the claim of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is speaking presently to a people who have long ago lost their way. Long years before, the cloud of God's glory had departed from Israel. It had once filled the Holy of Holies, of, the, of which the temple before that he is now standing. When they built the temple back in 1 Kings 8, the cloud came down and no one could even stay on their feet. It says they couldn't even stand because the glory filled the temple. And during the years of wilderness wanderings, the tabernacle was lit by the Shekinah glory of God. But because the people chose to live in sin, there came a point when the visible, tangible presence of the light of God departed. So now every night they have to light the candelabra. But on the last night of the feast, which is the event that we are looking at this morning, they didn't light it because they were rolling things up. It always seems a little sad, doesn't it, when you have to take down the Christmas tree. It's terrible to have to take down the lights. It's depressing, but of course, it was far worse for them, and here's why. They were not just taking down the decoration, decorations. The last night of the feast had to be depressing. The last night of the feast was worse than the last night of any other feast. Why would I say that? 
Because in that temple court, in front of those cold, dark lamps, it was impossible not to realize the glory light of God's cloud had not been seen anywhere in the temple for years, for centuries. The prophet Ezekiel had actually declared Ichabod, which means the glory is gone. Ichabod literally means without glory. Consequently, the people of God had to light candles and trim lamps in the temple because the Shekinah, the true light, had long since departed. Now the innermost shrine was empty, and even the lamps that commemorated the departed cloud had now been put out. Now here stands Jesus, perhaps right in front of one of these candlesticks in the temple saying, I am the light of life. I am the Shekinah, the glory, and I'm now back among you. In this context and against this background, Jesus cries, I am the light of the world. I am the cloud. I am God with you. I am Emmanuel. Here was God once again with his people. And as an aside, note how the statement is completely exclusive. He doesn't say, I'm a light, one among, one among, one among many, but the light. The one and only source of truth. Later he would invite a crowd of listeners to become children of the light through belief. And he also once predicted the future of his disciples by saying, after I depart, you will be the lights of the world. But it's not just enough to agree that Jesus is the light. He calls us to take the next obedient step, and that is to follow him. To follow the Lord Jesus means to believe on him, to trust him, and the results are life and light for that believer. The unsaved are walking in darkness because they love the darkness. One of the major messages in the gospel is that spiritual light is now shining, but people cannot comprehend it, and so they try to extinguish it. So when he says, I am the light of the world, and when he says, whoever follows, that immediately he shows he's not talking about this the way that many people think about it. This is not some kind of abstract principle. He's not talking about philosophy. He's not saying enlightenment in some general way. He is saying you have to follow it. This is a moving light, just like it was in the book of Exodus. What he's trying to say is, I and I alone can bring you eternal life. You know, when the sun comes up in the spring and starts to get near the earth, things melt and things begin to grow. I think likewise with Jesus, he could say, when I come near you, the same thing should occur. The hardness of your heart should begin to melt and fruit should begin to grow. When I stop just being an inspirational example to you, but I actually become your light, the way that you will know is you're going to begin to change. The life of God comes into you and you will begin to change. But we have to actively follow him for this to happen. And I mean follow. Because sometimes we can have the tendency to either run ahead of him or linger far behind. Alexander McLaren, who writes on this theme, observes, It is neither reverent nor wise to be treading on the heels of our guide in our eager confidence that we know where he wants us to go. On the other hand, we're not to be slow either. For as McLaren states, we're not to let the warmth of the campfire or the pleasantness of the shady place where our tent is pitched keep us there when the cloud is lifted. The only place of blessing is under the shadow of God's presence. And the only way to know and experience that is to follow Jesus wherever he leads us. So let me ask us, have we been shining? If not, I can give us the reason. If your Christian life is flat, dull, and bearing little fruit, I can tell you why. 
from my own personal experience. The last eclipse of the sun we experienced here in America was August 21st, 2017. For a brief time, the sun was eclipsed by the moon. Now the same thing can happen spiritually. If we aren't vigilant and careful, we can allow things to eclipse the sun. Not the S-U-N, but the S-O-N from our lives. And as they come between us and the Lord, things quickly will grow dark. And when that happens, what we are really doing is retreating back into the darkness that we have been saved from. The Apostle Paul, perhaps meditating on this very verse with St. Philippians 2.14, Do all things without grumbling or complaining, you may, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine like lights in the world. As we finish up, I would challenge all of us. Live lives of integrity. Live like children of the light. Don't be any different in the dark than you are in the light. Don't be any different when no one is looking. If you understand he is your light, you will not be any different when no one is looking. So be a person of integrity. Secondly, live attractively. Jesus says, you now are the lights of the world. And we know Jesus is beautiful. Is there anything beautiful about us, my beloved? Is there anything remarkable about us? When people watch us take criticism, when people watch how we treat people below us, when people watch us just deal with others, when people watch us handle trouble, are they amazed? Are they surprised? Is there anything different about us? Or maybe you're still struggling in the darkness of sin. Have you found God in Jesus? Is Jesus God with you? There is no other place in which you may find him. Come to him if you have never done so. And learn to say with John and the believer of all through the ages... The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only, from the Father, full of grace and truth. Father, we do thank you. It was no coincidence this morning, Lord, that Pastor John read that you have called us out of the darkness and into your marvelous light. And you are a marvelous Savior, Lord. There is no one like unto you. And Lord, eternity will be too short a time to praise and thank you for drawing us out of darkness and making us children of the light. And Lord, anyone within the sound of my voice who doesn't know you, I pray today that they will become sick of that darkness. And they would want that light, Lord. And they would flock to it and run to it. We know, Lord, that you will be there with open arms. I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.